Hello, everyone, and welcome to our GCN LGBT Talks. Um, and it is my great pleasure this evening, um, after we took a break last week, to welcome Orla Egan on to the show this evening. Um, many of you will know Orla, and she's the author of The Queer Republic of Cork, Cork's Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual and Transgender Communities, 1970 to the 1990s. And she created the Cork LGBT Archive to preserve and share information on Cork's rich history of LGBT activism and community formation. Uh, the physical collection is in Cork's Public Museum and the digital com collection can be found on www.corklgbtarchive.com and also on the digital repository of Ireland, DRI.ie. Um, and Orla, you have been collecting a lot of this and won awards for this collection. But before we start on that, um, I wanted to talk to you about your uh, gathering of the histories from the 1970s onwards. And uh, if you could tell us a little bit about 1970s Cork. Um, thanks, Mary. Um, I think, you know, if you look at 1970s Cork, your experience of it as a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender person really varied hugely. For some people, um, they felt really isolated. I remember talking to a woman who tried to find a lesbian community coming out in Cork in 1970, um, but couldn't find anybody. And it wasn't until she moved to London that she found a community. But the way she could find it, there was a really thriving and vibrant um, community. So there was a circuit of fabulous gay parties in Cork in the early 1970s, in the houses mostly of rich gay men, in Buttermint and Kinsale, there's a the whole circuit that people would travel around to. Um, and as well as that, so, um, people started to meet in a number of bars, uh, like the Imperial Hotel, um, the Green Room, which was quite close to the Opera House and had quite a theatrical uh, clientele and became known as a place that was welcoming to the gay community. Uh, there was a steeple bar, there was the Chateau on Patrick Street. So there were a number of places that people started to find one another um, and, and, and to gather. There was also, of course, the whole thing of people, you know, cruising in parks and uh, public toilets. But I think what's really interesting out of that is that it's not just about the sexual encounters, but that out of that cruising circuit came a network of lifelong friends. Um, and, and forming the beginnings of a community. Um, so I think that before we had the formal LGBT organisations setting up in uh, Cork, um, that you had the beginnings of, of community and, and social networks. So then you had the first um, LGBT organisation setting up in Cork in the mid 1970s with the Cork branch of the Irish Gay Rights Movement and then the establishment of the first gay centre in Cork in 1976. So, you know, a lot of things happening. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's very interesting that, that you know, these the, the sort of community comes out of the need for people to meet each other, and particularly in, in, in private houses or private parties or cruising, as you said. And it's very like the feminist movement, which started with coffee mornings. Uh, it's about trying to make connections with like minded people. And it's very interesting to hear that this is also we know uh, a lot of what uh, is happening uh, in Dublin already, having talked about it over the weeks, but also it's been written about. But of course, there is a non Dublin centric history out there as well. And it's very important that places like Cork and Limerick, Galway and the other cities in Ireland get these histories written as well. Um, and so, you know, that beginning of that community in Cork that you're, you're collecting the history for is very, very important. And where then do these um, sort of uh, social events begin to translate into structured or, or communities that are coming together? Yeah, I think in the mid 1970s, um, that people started looking at the establishment of an organization. So as I said, you had the Irish Gay Rights Movement setting up and the Gay Centre opening at number four McCurtain Street in the mid 1970s. And that was hugely important in terms of a space of our own. 
and the ability to um, create safe space, fun space. There was like club nights there at the weekends, but it was also about trying to challenge prejudice and misinformation about the community and reach out to others. So there was newsletters, there was corkscrew, there was Safar, which I think you can just about see behind my back. Um, yeah. And um, also the telephone helpline, tell a friend. Um, and you know, the, that kind of space was really, really important. People engaging with the media. There was a radio program in 1978 on homosexuals in Cork. Um, and again, it's around trying to kind of challenge that misinformation and and change the, the society and the environment in which we existed. Um, and I think it's interesting as well that, you know, late 1970s, you talk about the feminist movement, you had the Cork Women's Collective, which was a feminist organization, but with a really strong kind of lesbian involvement and presence in it. Um, and you would have had, you know, some women socialising in the gay uh, centre as well. It's mostly men, but there was a group of Cork lesbians who would socialise there. The first lesbian meeting that I know of in Cork was in January 1978. So I think it's interesting to look at that whole thing that stuff predates what we assume. You know, we assume that nothing's happening. And I think, you know, similarly, like with trans history, the work that, that Sarah Phillips has been doing in terms of challenging that concept of there's no trans history in, in Ireland and that the Friends of Eon was established in, in Dublin, a uh, transgender organization in the mid 1970s. So I would assume, you know, that, that kind of the core community would have been socializing there. Um, so I think there's a lot of things happening before we think. Now, the 1980s was, a different country. It was an explosion yeah. of activism. But I suppose I always want to kind of just acknowledge the fact that there was a precursor to that. And and, uh, and as I said, like, uh, you know, there was so much happening in terms of civil rights anyway. It would have been unusual, I suppose, had something not started in the 70s uh, with feminism, yeah. with civil rights movements, with sexual liberation. Um, that had to have had an impact on people's confidence to actually start and, and also the language they you know beginning to to create a language about homosexuality or lesbianism as well um in the 1970s so um and it's interesting to hear it's happening outside of dublin as well which is which is um you know part of this broader history but yes as you say in the 1980s you do have that uh, explosion of activism, which is interesting because the 1980s are really regarded as a dark decade of moving statues and endless rain and, uh, you know, an economic depression and a referenda that were lost. But at the same time, you do have LGBT activism beginning to really find its feet. Yeah, and I think that it's not in isolation. The things that you mentioned there and um, I mean, in Cork in particular, there was such integration between the different groups and individuals who were campaigning on different issues. So while you had a quite a strong and active LGBT community, they coexisted alongside and with um, the campaigns against the 1983 amendment. The you know, there's a huge difference as well, like between you know the tension that there was in Dublin around gay men not wanting to get involved. Um, in the anti-amendment campaign, and then Cork, the Cork Gay Collective, um, they were very actively involved in fighting the um, 1983 um, amendment and kind of cut their political teeth on it in lots of ways. Um, and you you had um, a lot of people being able to in, engage with one another in the key co-op and loafers. So I think one of the things that was really strong in Cork is having those premises where people could gather, where there was a sharing of information and ideas. So, you know, somewhere like the, the co-op created space for the further development of the LGBT community, but also had environmentalists and a food co-op and a bookshop. And it's where a lot of the kind of, you know, radical campaigns of the 1980s would have happened, do you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah. there that we see kind of, you know, the first kind of, more organized lesbian um, organizations and, and discussion groups and the institution of the Thursday night in loafers. Um, so, you know, Thursday night uh, became women's night in loafers. The back room of loafers bar was women only. 
Um, and that was a real stable of the community. Like every Thursday night, you knew you could find lesbians and loafers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it varied hugely. Sometimes it was, you know, a uh, quiet kind of gathering, like a lot of times there's big political discussions and the stuff that you're talking about of the international stuff, that very much came in. But I think that you had a lot of people kind of bringing back ideas as well, you know, so there was a consciousness of the Cork community of being aware of what was going on internationally. Um, but also you had a lot of Cork people who would have emigrated, say, to London and then would mm -hmm. come back Cork for things like the Women's Fun Weekend and bring all their friends with them. So you ended up having a lot of the politics that was going on in London and in the London lesbian kind of community coming into Cork and really interesting kind of like fertilization of ideas and politics and sex. <laughs> And uh, I think you also said, uh, I think some time ago to me, that uh, there was a connection, or maybe it was something you responded to in another talk. There was a, a good connection, strong connection between the Belfast women and the Cork women, uh, and yeah, the exchange yeah. of ideas and skills and all of that. Yeah, I mean, I think there were very strong connections between the Cork lesbian community and lesbian communities elsewhere, uh, very strong connections with the Galway community. Um, and then the, the Belfast one, there was uh, Cooperation North um, was a funding um, organisation that supported interaction between community groups in the Northern Ireland and in the Republic. So in the late 1980s, the women in the women's place in the key co-op, there was a, a separate women's space, and um, they did an exchange with uh, Belfast News. Um, so the Northwest women showed the Cork women how to produce a newsletter. So there's a whole series of really interesting Cork women's newsletters that are in the archive that resulted from that. And the women's place had a library. So they taught the Belfast women how to create a women's library. And then following on from that, the following year, they built on, on that network and got further funding to do an all-Ireland lesbian Cooperation North Exchange. So you had lesbian lines in Cork, Belfast, Derry, uh, Galway, Dublin, and I think Limerick. Mm -hmm. all together. And if you're thinking about at that time, people had very little funding and resources and uh, being able to kind of pool resources to get kind of training to develop kind of resources for the lesbian lines was really important. And they actually won an award from Cooperation North that year for that exchange. Do you know? So yeah. there was a lot of that kind of inter interaction. And that was very important, of course, for um, building on both, you know, locally, but also in, an, in a national sense, um, the connections between the various lesbian collectives and lesbian groups, because, of course, that would play into politics. But to, to concentrate on Cork, um, a lot of um, what Cork was famous for, in my mind anyway, was the um, social side of it. Because you know, I, I, I didn't live in Cork at any stage, but Cork had quite a, a, a reputation for being a very sociable city for LGBT, but particularly for lesbians. Yeah, I think one of the things I've always loved about Cork is it combines that whole really strong political activism with a real sense of fun and of the need to create spaces to have fun and to be able to create our own community as well. You know, so if you if you think about your you're existing in a society that is homophobic and sexist and prejudiced and you know instead of constantly reacting to that it was around creating spaces that were for the kind of development and enjoyment and relishing of lesbian community and culture so in the 1984 like you said 1980s really heavy duty political activism a lot of really difficult stuff going on for women so the women in court decided to have a fun weekend um, so women travelled from all over Ireland, as I said, people who'd emigrated came back to Cork. Um, I have a memory of busloads of women coming down from Belfast, whether that's fantasy or reality, but I have memories of, of that. Um, and it was a whole weekend that was predominantly lesbian, um, of fun, of workshops, of sports, of pub quiz, and a big, huge kind of social on the Saturday night. Um, and I think that that was really important. And kind of later in the 1990s, 
you had the lesbian fantasy ball uh, starting in 1994. And again, it was around creating that space for, for play and for expression and for kind of playing with gender. And I think, you know, long before we had the language to talk about what that was, women in Cork were doing it and creating the space to do it. Yeah. And, and was there problems, for example, you know, in the 80s and into the 90s of finding venues? I mean, when you think about it, this is a very practical thing. What venues, uh, you know, agreed to host? You You did have the key co-op, but that wouldn't have been big enough to host uh, a fantasy ball or a big weekend. Well, the first um, Women's Fun Weekend, um, the Saturday Night Social was in Connolly Hall, which was the sit building. And I think, you know, there was a lot of support from trade unions and from allies in terms of creating the space for that. They had also hosted the 1981 National Gay Conference, I think, posters mm -hmm. here. And so that was really, really important in space. Sometimes it was difficult. Um, we were in Parky Queen one year, and I remember it not going down too well with the bar staff and at some stage a group of women being locked into kind of the bar by kind of hostile staff. So it wasn't always too easy, but it brought a lot of money to a venue. So, you know, for years it was in Boers Hotel and, you know, they would make a lot of money and it wasn't, you know, there was no trouble. Yeah, exactly. Um, the very first uh, lesbian fantasy ball was actually in Blackwell Castle. And, wow. and it was just amazing. You're literally arriving into the courtyard of a castle, all these lesbians in their finery for a lesbian fantasy ball. Um, and I think the thing that's interesting about all these things is that they continued. You know, the, the Women's Cork Women's Fun Weekend um, still runs. I mean, this year it had to be cancelled uh, because of COVID-19, but it, it's been running every year bar two now since 1984 and similarly the lesbian fantasy ball ran for years and um, so i suppose it is that thing of creating those spaces but they, they're very much a kind of political activism there as well mm -hmm. and, and I think he's been very good at kind of creating the, that duality of, of space yeah because we just uh, had a note in from um uh, is it lydia sheridan who said that she met um sarah jane cromwell um, and Tenny was born in 2004 at a meeting in Cork. So, you know, and, yeah. and again, you know, I think that the Cork is quite a, a strong trans history. And um, these right, I mean, the Tenny actually started in Cork. I think it was 2004. Yeah. And then it it kind of um, it didn't continue, and then restarted in Dublin a couple of years later. Uh, similarly, there was a Cork doctor, uh, Margaret O'Regan, who's one of the first doctors that provided support to the transgender community in Ireland. And people would travel from all over the country to Cork to meet with her. Um, she was killed very suddenly in an accident and it was a real loss to the transgender community. Um, and similarly, um, there's one of the, the first Irish transgender films written on the soul was produced by um, the fabulous Carol Keith. I'm a little bit biased. Sure. Um, yeah. You know, so there, there is that issue, but I think it's also important to acknowledge that in the 70s and the 80s, the community talked about itself as being a lesbian and gay community. And, you know, the bisexual community and the transgender community were there, but they weren't always acknowledged and yeah. often not always respected. And I think, you know, there was a lot of work to kind of move beyond that and to be more inclusive in how we organized ourselves as a community. Um, and it's it's not so the 1990s that I really kind of find, you know, explicit bisexual uh, organizations kind of being set up or groups being set up in Cork. And um, so, you know, it, it's not without tensions and difficulties. It's not all harmonious, but, you know, um, I think there is just always been so much happening. And, and again, if you move then into the kind of 1990s, you've got the opening of the other place, which is a lesbian mm -hmm. and a, um, community resource center. Uh, and it's there that the first bisexual group was organized. You had um, things like looking at 
uh, addiction within the community and having, you know, groups specifically around addiction or around married lesbians or sexual health projects. So, you know, a lot of the kind of activism in the 80s as well would have been around kind of safe sex and responding to HIV and AIDS and, you yeah. know, um, yeah. quite kind of difficult times. So a lot of activism, but in a context of hostility sometimes. So, you know, we talked about the lesbian lines. Um, so you had like Telefriend was set up in uh, 1970s and then in the early 80s, you had the Port Lesbian line and the gay information line. But they had huge difficulty in letting people know about the services because the local papers refused to run the adverts for them. Of course, yeah. yeah. Despite like a huge campaign and loads of support, they consistently didn't. And I think that's one of the things that's interesting in the archive is that we've copies of the correspondence going back and forth between the kind of um, LGBT community and the, the examiner and then refusing to do to run the ads. You know, so so that kind of difficulty as well, and people talking about the backlash, you know, in the 80s around AIDS, and you know, one woman talking about the fact that dentists wouldn't treat lesbians or gays because they're afraid you're going to bleed on them and that they would like, you know, get AIDS. Get AIDS yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah. You know, and that scare was there. And I think for people forget about that, that that was a real fear that those outside of the LGBT community had uh, of the scary, the gay disease as it was seen. Um, and so that backlash is there. And, and that's why things like uh, community centres became so important. And, and the backs of toilet doors, which is often where you got the phone number um, yeah. for feminists or for women to access information on abortion, for LGBT people to access information on where they could meet others uh, like yeah. themselves, where they could access any services. Yeah, and, and you know, the involvement in things like condom sense, the whole thing, I mean, it seems so farcical now when you think about the difficulties people had in accessing condoms and the no. whole campaign to try and like have access to condoms. Um, you know, so it really, you know, it was bizarre stuff happening in, in the midst of, of all the rest of it, you know? Yeah, and, and, and the campaigns by many of the gay, the, the gay rights organizations and gay men, gay men's health movement and all those were very important in actually just bringing the condoms into pubs and into spaces like that because you couldn't actually get at them. Um, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was a crazy time. I suppose no people will look back on this and they'll wonder what the, the idiot thing is we're putting ourselves through now in various ways. But it, that, that was, it was a difficult time. And I think we have to look at the 1980s and into the 1990s as a time on which we developed the very firm foundations on which a lot of rights for LGBT people uh, were, were, were based on. You know, we didn't get them until later on, but those beginnings are, are and those foundational beginnings are absolutely vital. Uh, and those community centers. Yeah, I mean, but, like, you know, there's been like, a perception, you know, that, you know, something like marriage equality just kind of happened, you know, that you had a couple of like uh, people in the media um, and then we suddenly got marriage quality, you know, and I think that, that there needs to be that acknowledgement that any of the kind of changes that have happened have built on decades and decades of people standing up for themselves, being proud to be queer and fighting against the prejudice that was there both within, you know, sort of as a lesbian and gay and bisexual transgender community, but also linking in with our allies. And, and I think there's a very strong history of the links with the trade union movement and getting support from the trade union movement for, um, you know, rights for lesbian and gay workers, uh, because you could easily be fired if somebody found out lesbian and gay um, and also in terms of kind of like changing kind of legislation and you know that was a very long campaign and there was a lot of court activists very involved in that and um, Kieran Rose who we later lost to, to Dublin but still a Corkonian uh, very involved in in that whole kind of movement with, with the trade union movements uh, getting those, those changes happening. So I think we do need to acknowledge that it's those decades and decades that built the foundation for change. And also if we Absolutely. go back 
to the 1981 National Gay Conference in Cork. There was a whole series of workshops there and there was a series of um, motions that were passed at that workshop and they basically set the agenda for the kinds of things that LGBT communities were working on in Ireland over the next couple of decades. You know, so, yeah. you know, that, that's amazing kind of, and all that material is, is there, do you know? Um, yeah. And I think, again, kind of, you know, talking about all these kind of Cork firsts and stuff, you know, it's also around looking at things like the um, Lesbian Gay Film Festival. You know, again, that started in Cork in the early 1990s. And having the other place, LGBT Community Resource Centre, gave that base to be able to do things like that. So organise yeah. the film festival, organise the first um, Irish LGBT float in the Patrick's Day Parade, which of course was, was that 1992. 1992. Um, yeah. And again, that's those international connections. You know, it was, it was you know, Cork women, Catherine O'Donnell coming back from New York talking about what was going on there with the Irish Lesbian Gay Organization not being able to march in Patrick's Day parades in New York and in Boston, you know, that you can't be Irish and queer. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, back of loafers on a Thursday night and we were kind of going, wouldn't to kind of show how ridiculous that is if we marched in Cork? So we applied and we said, sure. So we <laughs> marched. Um, you know, mixed reaction, you know, some people really enthusiastic, some stony faces, you know, I got hit in the head with a bottle, but it was a plastic bottle, so, you know, um, and when we won the prize for the best new entry in the Patrick's Day Parade that year. So I think the contrast between what was going on in the state and what was going on in Cork was huge. And at the front of the Cork float was a banner that said, Hello, New York and very much acknowledging those links. And on the 10th anniversary of the Ilgo protests, there was a big group that went from Cork and from Dublin to New York to support the Ilgo, you know, on the 10th anniversary of the protests. Mm -hmm. So there's so much connection. But I think the difficulty is that when it happened, happened in Dublin, we think it's not national history. That's national history. Well, if it doesn't happen in Dublin, it doesn't exist. But we're proving that wrong. There's a question here from Judith Finlay, who wants to uh, said fascinating discuss discussion. Obviously, nothing is running this year, but is the Lesbian Fantasy Bowl still actually running? It and if not, is anyone planning to revive it? It hasn't run for the last few years, um, but it ran for it ran from 1994 on for a good few years. I think one of the last ones actually ended up happening in um, West Cork in a hostel that was taken over for, for the, the night. Um, but not yet, but maybe, who knows, maybe, maybe it'll run again. Maybe it'll revive it. And then are there any gay Cork heritage sites out of curiosity? Any statues or any uh, plaques? That's really interesting. I uh, just wrote to the Heritage uh, Office in Cork City Council uh, around a week ago, suggesting that we put the plaques up in a number of venues. So I'm waiting to hear back about that. Um, and I think that that's, that's something that, that needs to be acknowledged as well, it is in terms of the support that I've gotten from the, the Heritage Council and from the Cork City Council Heritage Office. Um, and to me, that was like so symbolic um, in terms of acknowledging that um, LGBT history is an important part of our history and our heritage. Um, so, you know, the first, you know, it's a completely unfunded project. It's a work of madness and passion and it's completely voluntary. Um, and the only bits of funding we've gotten have been for very specific things. But the first bit of funding was from the Heritage Council for archive boxes. And yeah. I was really excited about like a, a stack of grey boxes arriving. Um, but I understand kind of, that. <laughs> I, I felt very sad but very happy as well, you know. But the yeah. Council Heritage um, Office has, has funded the um, has funded the book um, and they also funded the exhibition. So you know that that support I think is is really important. So the next step then is knocking on the door to see if we can get the plaques. Exactly. And I think that's something we need to do all over the country. I have a few in mind for Dublin as well. So we'll be all knocking on doors for that. But I wanted to talk to you before moving on to talk about the archive about Link. 
uh, which I think is a very important centre to have in Cork. And, you know, the history of that and when it's set up, I, I do remember coming down there maybe about 10 or 12 years ago to do, um, we were doing a queer certificate uh, out of UCD gender studies and, and delivering a few lectures down there. And it's such an amazing um, resource to have that it, we don't have similar in Dublin. Yeah, it was 1999, 1999, the first Centre opened in Cork. Um, and, I, and I suppose it kind of came from that background of um, the Lesbian community in Cork kind of trying to share space over the years with uh, gay men, with other feminist organisations, you know, various kind of things. And sometimes it worked really well, and other times it was difficult and there was tension around resources and priorities um, and, and some difficulties. So in the late 1990s, uh, there was some European funding came into Dublin and there was a little bit um, sent to Cork. Um, and there was a couple of, of community meetings where people had these very, very long fantasy lists about all the things we wanted until we realized how little money there was available. Um, but it, it enabled, um, there to be funding for the first year's rent for uh, a lesbian centre. So it opened in 1999 in George's Street, George's Key. Difficulty was trying to find low cost, short term rentals in Cork and um, not being able to be open initially about what we were renting it for. Um, and with good cause because the landlords ended up being really homophobic. Um, so, you know, there was all those difficulties. So initially it opened as Cork the Kirky, uh, Cork Friends, uh, which in one way was Irish and welcoming, but it was also obscuring what it was. Um, and then the following year it moved to Princess Street and the name was changed to Link and then to White Street. So, you know, there's, there's a long history of that. And again, initially there was no funding for staff and then some funding coming in to get staff, which enabled more things to be happening. Um, and creating this kind of very vibrant space with a huge range of activities happening that is unique in Ireland. Mm -hmm. It is, and I think every every city and every large town should have similar uh, spaces for LGBT communities. And of course, that's another thing that you know we need to go for national funding for. But I want to talk to you particularly about um, because it's an interest of mine having worked on the IQA and getting that into the National Archive, you basically have pulled together with, with some help and volunteers an LGBT Cork archive, which is an extraordinary thing to do. Um, and you're starting with the Arthur Leahy collection yeah. uh, and building on that. That's your fundamental core of it. So what is the Arthur Leahy collection and how important is it? Well, Arthur Lee has been an activist in Cork since the 1970s. Um, I think uh, Patrick was talking, Patrick McDonough, when he was almost talking about the uh, interview with the Cork couple in like the late 70s, early 80s on RTE. That was Arthur and his partner, Laurie. And Arthur was one of the people involved in setting up the key co-op. He's still there. He's still working there. Um, and so very, very active in, in the community and in a range of kind of political movements and social change movements in Cork. So Arthur had the foresight to start sticking things in boxes. He wasn't sure what was going to happen with them, but he knew it was important to start keeping things. So he mm -hmm. stuck them in boxes and he put the boxes in his basement. And he had no idea what was going to happen with this. He told me one stage he thought that when he died, somebody would find them and do something with them. And um, so I asked, could I work with them? So I had used the material um, back in around 2000 when I was doing some research on the lesbian community. Um, and then uh, came back like a little while later and said, whatever happened to all that? And he said, it's still in the basement. Now, the difficulty is a damp basement is not ideal circumstances. No. Um, for a um, an archive, so basically, I, I took on kind of working with it. So it was a really, really steep learning curve for me trying to figure out what to do with this. So the first step was to get it out of the basement and start to try and sort it, put some kind of physical order on it. So kind of just doing that on a voluntary basis, like uh, with one or two um, people, Liz Steiner Scott, who used to work in UCC, used to come in mm -hmm. every week to kind of help with that sorting. We had a couple of sorting days. Um, 
Well, you know, of course, Liz, being, Liz was a historian, of course, so yeah. she'd been able to give you a bit of a advice around how to create an archive. She's a historian, but also a kind of, you know, an activist in Cork, so would have understood the material that she was looking mm -hmm. at. But it was very much kind of, you know, that kind of ad hoc basis of trying to figure it out. And a, and a lot of the time it was, it was, you know, putting your hand into the treasure trove and seeing what you'd find. And um, so we started trying to kind of do some work with physical archive, but simultaneously wanting to kind of get that information out. So creating a digital archive. And again, you know, doing that as somebody who started with very few digital skills or knowledge and trying to figure out how to do this in a low cost or no cost and um, low tech way. So, you know, a lot of learning involved in that, but um, created the Cork LGBT archive. And then that enabled me to kind of showcase some of what was in there to kind of, you know, and, and to enable people to see some of that rich history, which I think helps get a little bit of funding to do other things with it. So the, the Cork the Archive has a number of different bits to it. So you've got the physical collection, the digital archive, then the exhibition and the book and social media. But it's all done on a voluntary basis, primarily by me. And I think that's a huge difficulty in terms of... Um, this kind of work, that it's not being kind of supported in terms of proper staff and resources. Um, and it takes, you know, somebody like me or somebody like Sarah Phillips or Tony Walsh, somebody who's got that kind of passionate interest to do it. But, it, you know, what happens when we're not there anymore? Who keeps this going? So I think there's issues in terms of long-term kind of sustainability of it. Um, and I think for me as well, I was, around trying to, to find community, find support as I was doing this. Um, and when I started, there was nobody really doing the kind of thing that I was trying to do in Ireland. So I started to look abroad and find a community and make those queer connections. Um, and, you know, kind of linking in with archives in New York and, you know, the Out History archives there and looking at what they were doing. Um, linking in with archives in the UK, like um, Ruckus, which is a fabulous black queer archive in London. Um, and then the, going to the AMS conferences, which is the Archives, Libraries, Museums, Special Collections. Uh, they do an LGBT conference every couple of years and went to one in London a few years ago. And it was just amazing. It was just absolutely amazing. And went to the, the same conference in Berlin last year. And that's my tribe. And I think that's been so important for me in terms of, of learning from people, but also in terms of sustaining me to kind of do the stuff that I'm doing and, and feeling that it's part of this international kind of movement of people trying to create um, these, these kinds of archives and, and learning from one another and huge diversity within it, you know, from, you know, the archive I'm doing with no funding to, you know, there's um, an archive in Bergen that has like huge funding and staff and resources, you know, so there's like a huge range within it. But people being so generous in sharing um, how they do things um, and like linking in with, with people like um, Jamie Lee in Arizona, who kind of talks a lot about kind of clearing the archive. So I suppose the other one important for me was around figuring out what is this thing that I'm doing? You know, I'm not a trained artist. You know, it's more than a history project. You know, so what is this about? And looking at the politics of the archives and yeah. looking at this whole assertion that, you know, archives are supposed to be this kind of neutral, impartial kind of, you know, repositories of our history, but like not. in the archives. And, and, you know, the, the work has been done by so many community archives um, and theorists who are looking at, at the work that's been done by those who don't see themselves in the archive and yeah. creating our own archives. But in doing that, challenging the fundamentals of what is an archive and who can archive and how you do it. You know, so I think there's been a whole kind of political kind of journey for me as well and philosophical journey. So I finally got to the place where I had a label for myself. So I call myself a queer archival activist because I need this And, yeah. you know, so, yeah, but it took me a while to figure all that out. Yeah. Um, 
I think the difficulty then is in terms of sustaining the project and I think there's a huge amount still to be digitized and uh, the physical collection hasn't fully been sorted yet um, and I had some temporary space that I was using to, to work on that and I lost that space. Um, I fantasized about this um, rich um, kind of like queer version of Chuck Feeney that was going to emerge to kind of like fund it but they never emerged. Um, yes. So we had to make the, the really difficult decision to to let it go to the public museum, and and that was challenging in terms of of letting go of it and wondering what would happen with it and worrying about access and learning from some of the kind of messages and our history as well around the Irish Queer Archive and you know issues that people had in terms of being able to access material within the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you know it was a, a lot of time to figure out what to do, but. The Cork Public Museum had taken it. Um, there's a statue of Devon Era right outside the door of the Cork Public Museum. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I like the symbolism of that. But they yeah. have to, to kind of, you know, finishing, sorting and cataloging that and they will then make the physical collection accessible. And then there's a commitment to creating a permanent Cork LGBT exhibition in the Public Museum. And to yeah. me, that is fantastic when it happens because the Public Museum of Cork has been moving beyond the kind of, you know, traditional version of what the museum would have. Now, they still have the fabulous model of the, the Cork City walls and all of those things, but they all, they've developed a permanent uh, traveler exhibition there. And um, mm -hmm. Recently, they have created a Jewish exhibition using remnants from the synagogue that closed in Cork. And now there's a commitment to having the LGBT. The queer history. Yeah. So every student in Cork who gets dragged into the museum will see this in the near future, hopefully. And that's fantastic. And I, and I, I really take you, and I think it's a very, very pertinent and, and powerful point to make that that archives are not neutral spaces and they never have been. Um, they are tr changing and trying to be more inclusive and a lot of them are being including the, our National Archives and then the National Library of Ireland taking the IQA on. Um, and that's very important to have them there but you're right when you leave them go into these spaces you're also leaving go of a certain control of our own histories and our own narratives and how they are presented and how they are out there. And, and that's difficult for a community that has been so, um, you know, looking after itself for so long, then to, to kind of let it go out there into the public, into the public history museum. Uh, and spaces like that need to, you know, show our class histories, our traveler histories, the Jewish histories and the LGBT histories. Um, and I think, you know, um, getting involved with the Digital Repository of Ireland has been excellent as well, because, of course, that makes accessibility uh, more. But yeah. it doesn't mean everything is accessible. And, and like the IQA, there, there are still accessibility issues. And that is problematic when we do let go to, you know, because, of course, you want to be part of the national narrative. But in order to do that, you have to let go sometimes. Yeah, and I think it is a, a difficulty, and I think we're all who are best with it, you know, to navigate that kind of like difficult space of of being part of the National Library, but then you know what happens with it when it's there, or you know, being part of the Public Museum in Cork, and yeah. you know what what happens with it there, um, and then in terms of the of the DRI, I mean, I suppose you know I, I created uh, the digital archive, like I said, I, I did quite a low cost kind of low tech model which I kind of have um, shared the kind of like, you know, details of how to do that with a number of groups as well. Like, because part of my, what I wanted to do was develop a model that was replicable by other community groups who were in similar situations. But uh, I, I realized um, fairly early on that, um, you know, long-term digital preservation is, is a really important area. And, you know, like, you know, we, we can't read floppy disks now. So, no. you know, format that we have things in now, will they be readable in 10 years or 20 years? And um, so the work of kind of, you know, digital preservation and ensuring like that long-term access to digital resources, it's huge. And, and I kind of, you know, sometimes I know my own limits and I realized I didn't have the time or resources or skills to do that myself. So I was really delighted uh, when the Digital Repository of Ireland 
ran a uh, community um, archives um, scheme. And so the first year that they ran that, the Cork LGBT Archive won it. So um, that facilitated putting the Cork LGBT Archive collection into the DRI. So the DRI is a digital repository of Ireland. So that's the natu nationally funded digital yeah. repository. And so I think on both a symbolic and practical level, that's really important because yeah, yeah. level, they do the work of making sure that that material is preserved and accessible. Mm -hmm. But on a symbolic level, again, you're coming into the national repository um, and it's visible as part of, of what is being preserved. And then the um, DRI uh, links then to Europeana which is the European kind of, you know, cultural kind of hope, like around mm -hmm. the resources. So via the, the DRI, the Cork LGBT Archive collection is now on Europeana, um, which again has been fabulous because um, adding the extra material there gave the impetus to the Europeana crowd to do uh, LGBT exhibitions and look at developing kind of maybe a strand of looking at LGBT stuff within Europeana. So it all kind of, you know, kicks on to more and more happening um, yeah. and, and makes it, it more visible. Um, but, you know, like I said, there's, there's so much more to be added. And one of the things that I really would like to do is to have people recording our histories as they're happening, um, you know, so that we don't end up going into somebody's closet or basement or wherever to try and find stuff in the future, that we start getting into the habit of recording the things we're doing as we're doing them. And um, so I ran a training um, session in Cork earlier this year to try and train kind of Cork LGBT organizations on how to add their own material into the archive. Mm -hmm. uh, and to try and encourage people to do that so that it's being preserved as it's being created. And um, there was to be a follow up, but you know, the world went crazy in the meantime. Well, yes. Uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, I totally agree with you in that as somebody who uses archive on um, a professional basis constantly. Uh, and it, last week went into an archive searching out um, loving around 1919, 1920, and there they were. Uh, and, you know, that wasn't a queer archive, but I think, you know, we have to queer the existing archive, which has material that has not been catalogued properly in that it doesn't indicate what's there because, of course, from homophobia, really, people did not want to talk about that. And so uh, even if there is queer stuff in the archive, LGBT uh, or histories, um, it, it possibly isn't catalogued properly for us to this. But if you get modern from the 1970s, as you've collected LGBT archives into the into the national repositories, well, then I think it helps, you know, uh, a change of attitude, um, and not only on the archive that is being put in, but also on um, looking at other archives and how they might also contain material. Yeah. Um, that help write our histories, even longer histories, a century, two centuries. Or more. No, I absolutely agree. You know? And I think it's easier when you're when you're dealing with self-identified, you know, queer material. But I think, you know, there's this whole standard of proof that's required around, you know, historical LGBT stuff is a very different standard of proof. You know, like how do we know that they really like, you know, were lesbian and do you know like the, the, the kind of standard you do it? And you're like, we never asked that of a straight couple. No, I mean, I always kind of talk about, you know, the, the letter between Michael Collins and Kitty, Kitty O'Shea. Kitty uh, Kiernan. Kitty Kiernan, sorry. And, <laughs> and that proof, apparently, that he was heterosexual. But, you know, you have the, the, the two women who, who are literally buried together in Glasnevin and people still querying about whether they're lesbian or not. Yeah. You know, despite having spent a lifetime together and literally buried together. So I think our standard of proof needed is is very very different do you know well this is why i think calling yourself a, what is it a queer 
a uh, queer activist, activist is very important because, of course, um, historians and activists can, uh, you know, uh, promote this whole idea of objectivity and we approach everything with a certain objectivity, which, of course, is not true. Uh, nobody can be that objective. And as long as you recognize your subjectivity, then you can approach material in a way that allows you to do uh, a very good analysis. Um, but we need activists who are determined to get the material historians or researchers would write about into the archive. Yeah, and yeah, and I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I suppose if, if you know, complaining that you know the focus of you know Irish LGBT history is Dublin centric, then there's an onus on me in some ways to provide information that enables more of a story to be told. Um, yeah. and enables that to kind of open up um, and that there's material there and I suppose my ethos around it is always to have it be as open as possible so that people can use it in multiple different ways um, and I think you know a couple of decades ago the the only kind of inverted commas Irish LGBT histories that were being produced were just kind of personal accounts yeah. uh, usually by kind of gay men in Dublin and if, if they weren't directly involved in it, it didn't exist. And I think that from when I started in this to, to now, I think the world is changing. And we do have a new generation of, of scholars and museum um, workers and archivists who are doing it a little bit differently. And, and I think, you know, you had Patrick and I've done it on a few weeks ago. And I think that it's really interesting when you look at the work that he's doing. It is an Irish. LGBT history, and he's made yes. concerted efforts to ensure that he's not just telling a Dublin-centric version of Irish history. Um, and I think having the Cork LGBT archives then facilitates that work. So it's kind of mutually beneficial. And you know, you have people like Judith Finley, who's kind of trying to very much kind of open up, like how the kind of it's been done from the inside of those institutions as well. So I think that the world is changing. Uh, in terms of, of how we're doing this, definitely from when I started off and it felt like a very kind of, um, uh, you know, not many other people kind of doing this. No, this no, battle, yes. And, and it's also around kind of um, sharing that information with one another as well. And I have to say, Sarah Phillips has been so generous in, in kind of sharing information with me because I think that we have to look at you know, the, you know, we have to look at the exclusions and the absences within the archives in general, but I think we also have to look at the exclusions and absences in our own work. And I think yeah. we have concerted efforts to, to kind of rectify that. So mm -hmm. I know, like, you know, Arthur Lee's collection is fabulous. It's amazing. It's a treasure trove, but there was no trans stuff in it. So I knew I needed to kind of um, make a concerted effort to find that history. And, you know, a pity poor, poor Sarah came to Cork for a business meeting and, and had me kind of basically kind of sucking information out of her. Um, but I think as well, you know, you know, there's, there's a greater awareness at the moment around the whole Black Lives Movement and, you know, around the absences of um, our ethnic roots in, in the archives and particularly in Ireland and the traveler community. So mm -hmm. um, I'm really happy that in the next wee while there's going to be a contribution in the Cork LGBT archive from a Cork uh, lesbian traveler. Um, and that's again something that I sought to try and kind of look at the absences that are there in the work that I'm doing as well. So I think we need to be reflective on how we do this work. Do you know? Absolutely. And, and you can see that you're doing that. Sorry? You can see that you're doing that. And actually, um, we could discuss this all night. I mean, I love talking about archives and, and what we need in them and those voids and absences and what's there and not there. But we've a few minutes left. And I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Like, is there anything in particular in the archive, one piece or piece, one or two pieces that really are your favourite? I've always loved the um, the ticket from the the actual original ticket from the gala ball at the 1981 uh, National Gay Conference in Cork, you know, because it's just so of its time. But also, it was one of the first times. 
that you had same-sex couples dancing in a kind of venue like Connolly Hall together, and that was hugely symbolic for people. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all about, it's of its time as well in terms of, um, you know, the, the the supper that you had, like, with your dance, you know? Um, the other piece that I really, um, I'm really grateful to have is an interview with Dave Roach um, on one of the kind of community sorting days that we had with Cork LGB Archive. And um, Dave, you know, died three years ago and a kind of gay icon in Cork and in the Cork community. And it's so lovely to have that record of the two of us having a discussion about why the archives are so important and why it's so important to preserve our history. So, so that's a treasure mm -hmm. for me. And um, I love as well the Cork Gay Collectors Manifesto because I think, you know, in the 1980s, like everybody had a manifesto, but I think mm -hmm. um, Carl Kerrigan would talk about the fact that it was hammered out over weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and every word thought about. But what I really love is that they situate the struggle for gay rights very much in the context of the links with the feminist movement, that it's all about control of gender and sexuality and those links about kind of how that impacts on women, how it impacts on the queer community and being really explicit about those links. And this is like early 1980s and also about the kind of need to connect with uh, communities internationally. Um, yeah. And then the other one that I really love is uh, some posters from the Women's Place in Cork that are um, hand drawn. I think, I don't know if you can actually see this, but oh, it's, yes. it's hand drawn. Every single letter is coloured in with a different kind <laughs> of symbols. And, and, and I suppose it kind of teaches us a lot about how how things were made in, yeah. in, this, in, in this era that wasn't so techy and how things were shared, because a lot of this was around trying to communicate in an era um, that there wasn't social media, that it wasn't so easy just to kind of put together a poster, stick it up on social media and everybody knows about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a final quick question for you, Mary, which is when you were searching all the kind of lesbian couples and uh, in Cor in Dublin, sorry, in the kind of um, 1916 and the Nashes move and all that, have you found any in Cork? And are you going to be adding material to the Cork LGBT community on the kind of revolutionary nationalist trade unionist in that era? No, I haven't found any in Cork and that now leads me to a challenge to go looking yeah. uh, because I've been concentrating on the archives in Dublin um, and the the sort of radical feminists that were in a sort of broad circle or, yeah. um, in, in, in the Dublin movements of feminism, trade union activism um, and revolutionary activism. But I'm sure there are some out there. I actually, well, I, I, I won't say their names because I haven't proved it yet, but I did find... Um, two names that seem to be talked about as a couple in the archives the other day. Um, and one of the women is from Sligo. So we are moving outside of Dublin. Uh, yeah. So if I can, if I can find more proof about their relationship, I will have a non Dublin couple. Um, yeah. No, great. nobody from Cork so far, but. Well, there's I, your challenge. I'd like to find Kerry people too. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And you know, we, we were talking about the 1970s, but we can go much further back as well. If you, oh, if you look at all in the 1600s, that you had a woman who was accused of being a witch because she bewitched a woman with her kiss. And Florence, Florence Newton, isn't it? Yes. yes. And, yeah. You know, Anne Bonny, the kind of famous pirate, you know, was from Cork as well, and Somerville and Ross. So we can go back further as well. So I suppose. Yeah. While I'm concentrating on the 70s and 80s and 90s, I'm really open to including other material that people like yourself find. And uh, yes. yeah. yeah, and that's fantastic. And of course, you've written the um, book, The Queer Republic yes. of Cork, um, yeah. which is available still. Yes, it is available. Um, there's a link on the uh, Cork LGBT archive to it. So it's available to buy, but I've also decided to put it up online so it's also available to download free and um, to read because again for me it's about putting it out there and having that available and letting people access it you know? very good and the uh, you can now see loads of people are 
pressing the download PDF um, and the exhibition that goes along with the the archive is still it's it's in the Public History Museum now. No, um, the first version of the exhibition was actually like some of what I have behind me, where it just I had no funding for it, so I just printed stuff on photographic material and had an exhibition in, in Camden Palace Community Arts Centre in Cork. Um, but then the Cork City Council funded the production of a number of pull-up exhibition banners. So there's now six banners um, which kind of tell the history from the kind of 70s, 80s and 90s. And they've been on display in various places in Cork, in Belfast City Hall, which was lovely. They went to Berlin last year. Um, and it's a really kind of portable, easy way to kind of like show that history and for people to be able to engage with it. Um, and um, then the idea is that the public museum will develop an exhibition which is resides a bigger exhibition, yeah. yeah. Um, the KG, he says, and Bonnie may have been from Kinsale. Yes. Believe it or not, we've been talking for an hour and we're coming to the end of this. And uh, hopefully either next week or the week after, I'm, I'm, it, the details haven't been uh, hammered out yet. We will be talking about a little bit of what you were talking about. We'll be talking about two activists who were involved in the uh, campaign to get uh, the LGBT community in New York marching in the St. Patrick's Day Parade, which I think is a very important part of our broader histories, our diaspora histories as well, um, and how important that was and, and the responses of the LGBT community in Ireland to those campaigns. There was a lot of doing and throwing. But thank you very much, Orla, and thank you very much for your collecting. Of, um, you know, this is, a, this is a lifelong devotion, you know, um, and your activism as an archivist has, you know, been so important to LGBT history and Cork, particularly LGBT history, and do continue doing it. And I hope other people will take inspiration from you. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye.